Now, uh, what you see here, this is a low-end Rolex. Basic, classic. Runs you about five grand. Now, there are models that go up from there. But for a really good Rolex, you're looking to spend upward to fifteen to a hundred thousand dollars. I'm getting a lesson on fancy watches in my apartment from the guy that sleeps on my couch. <laughs> His name is Paul. My boyfriend at the time, Ben, met Paul at the methadone clinic. My boyfriend, Ben, attracted all sorts of nefarious characters, but Paul really stuck out. My dear Ben and I had been together for a few years. He had that black slick back hair, always wore a black band t-shirt, black converse. He had looked the same since he was 15, and I was still going through my boys with tattoos and hardcore drug addiction phase <laughs> that I would eventually grow out of. Back to Paul, he drove a convertible BMW. He was tall and handsome, tan yet a little gaunt, he was always clean-shaven and well-dressed. His style was similar to the preppy bad guy in 80s movies. <laughs> Paul was about 45, but could pass for 35. Heroin will do that to you, kind of like formaldehyde. <laughs> he wore chinos and polo shirts. He always had a cannon or a Nikon around his neck and a Rolex on his wrist. I once asked him if he loved to take pictures. Are you kidding me? This thing doesn't even have film in it. It's expensive. It makes me look rich. It was all about the grift. Paul grew up in La Jolla, a rich kid in the 80s. His mom and dad owned a jewelry store. His knowledge of diamonds and gemstones was impressive. Paul started doing drugs in high school. Crack, PCP, heroin. As an adult, he served five years of a 10-year sentence for stealing TVs and electronics from Best Buy. When the judge sentenced him, Paul's knees buckled and he cried. He once told me how he tried to buy rock in Sherman Heights in, the 19, in 1989. He was a white boy in his mom's white Porsche. The drug dealer tried to steal the car, and when Paul wouldn't get out, the guy shot him. Paul drove to the hospital bleeding all over that fine Italian leather and crashed into the emergency room entrance. He was 17 at the time. And I think it goes without saying that I kind of worshipped him. <laughs> ben and I both did. We had our own personal small time hood. That's why when Paul's girlfriend kicked him out, we offered him our couch. No questions. I remember going into his backpack to look for a cigarette and finding a gun. I had never seen a gun before. And like an idiot, I thought that was cool. He would bring me designer sunglasses and clothes. He knew what size jeans I wore. He once brought me a gold Michael Kors leather jacket. Fucking bitchin'. He even did the dishes, bought groceries, vacuum, scrubbed the toilet. I think these are habits you form when you're trying to keep your cell clean. And it stayed this way for months. We did drugs and wore fancy clothes. I had a normal office job working as a receptionist. That job paid the rent and the utilities. Paul and Ben would run errands all day that kept us in the fun stuff. We were an oddly functional family with a crack smoking, gun toting, Rolex wearing patriarch running the show. But it was around Christmas time that this all came to an end. I woke up one morning and my boyfriend was gone. Maybe he had gone to the methadone clinic early with Paul? I peeked, out of, I peeked my head out of the bedroom. Paul was still asleep. Did you see Ben leave? Nope. We waited a few hours and finally got a call from the San Diego County Jail. Ben had tried to steal DVDs from Vons at 5 a.m. in a clonopin-induced klepto frenzy. Obviously, in order to steal DVD from Vons properly, you need another person. One person would grab a basket, load it up with DVDs, throw a roll of tinfoil in, plus a large bag of potato chips to hide the DVDs. Then you would take that basket to the bathroom and throw everything in the trash can and leave the store. The second person would walk in with a backpack, go directly to the bathroom, wrap the DVDs in tinfoil to hide the centers, and walk out of the store. 
Therefore, the first person seen on video with the DVDs isn't really stealing them. They leave the store empty-handed. The second person is the one with the goods, and they're only seen on camera going to the bathroom and leaving. This was Ben's small-time grift, one that required two people. For him to attempt it on his own was suicide, but that morning he felt ballsy. He says he doesn't remember driving or loading up his backpack and running out. Security guard had to tackle him to the ground two blocks away. His face was scraped up. He broke his glasses. All over four copies of Die Hard 2 and Three Weddings and a Funeral. <laughs> Nothing is sadder than walking through Horton Plaza after work, Charlie Brown Christmas song playing, and having to visit your boyfriend in jail. Ben looked like shit. His hands were shaking. He was detoxing. And for some reason, his bail was really high. Maybe due to the fact that he was a repeat offender. Maybe the drugged up wrestling match with the rent-a-cop. Maybe because it was the holidays. But I was told he wouldn't be let out until after Christmas or could be released on a $10,000 bail. This was a figure I couldn't comprehend. $10,000? Luckily for me, the fine gentlemen at all pro bail bondsmen could explain it to me. By the way, the people that work at bail bondsmen's office are the nicest, most understanding people in the universe. He gave me a bottle of water, a cup of coffee, and two free t-shirts. <laughs> Did you know you're only required to pay 10% of the bail? The other 90% is waived upon his return to his court date. So $1,000. Could have been a million. 24-year-old me did not have that kind of scratch. But this is why God invented bail bondsmen. I just needed to come up with $500. The rest I would finance and pay back monthly at a double-digit interest rate. It's math and science and stuff. <laughs> so $500? It could have been a million. I just did not have that kind of money. And this is where my elegant thief my very own sweet Paul came up with a solution. A couple months before the Klonopin DVD debacle, Paul had stolen a Segway. He just two-wheeled that thing right off a lot. Rode that nerdy contraption down the street a few miles into his friend's garage, and that's where it stayed. Paul offered me the opportunity, opportunity to sell the stolen Segway. Paul was very bad at computers. It could have been generational or the years behind bars. All he needed was a well-written Craigslist ad and a pretty face to sell a thing. And I would earn $500 from the transaction and could finally make bail by Christmas. I posted, Segway for sale. The people mover. Slightly used Segway for sale runs great. Just never got around to riding it. This is the transportation of the future. $2,500 OBO. I got a call within the hour. This guy showed up later that evening. He was chubby, glasses. He had probably clocked in a few hours with a 20-sided die. We met in the alley behind my apartment. It looked sketchy as fuck. He asked why, I asked him why he wanted it, trying to calm him down and assure him this trade was on the level. His friends were starting a Segway club to ride around San Diego. Basically the world's dorkiest biker gang. Paul showed him how to work it, both of them taking turns whizzing up and down the alley. I kept my cool. This was the first person that called, the first person to show up. How much for it again? 2,500, I said sweetly. He didn't hesitate or haggle. He handed me an envelope heavy with 20s, more than enough for Ben's bail. When Paul and I got to the apartment, he handed me $200. My elegant con man was trying to pass one over on me. I sounded like a spoiled kid. Paul, you said 500. I need 500. Oh yeah, I forgot. Fucking junkies, man. We took the two bus from North Park to downtown. It was dark. After paying the bondsman, we still had to wait a few hours before Ben's release. It was about midnight. Paul and I passed the time drinking beers at one of those touristy nightclubs on Fifth Avenue, saluting what a great pair of criminals we made. It was true. It was all about appearances. He told me I was dangerous, sweet, charming, and beautiful. 
He bought me drinks and told me I could run the world. I imagined diamond heists and bank vaults and fake passports and jet planes, pink mansions and clawfoot tubs. After New Year and Ben's return, we had to kick Paul out. His crack habit had gotten out of control. He would sit in front of the window, peeking out of the blinds with his gun on his lap. He wouldn't let us leave the house, convinced we were being watched. The house was disgusting, and the expensive gifts stopped coming in, and I also couldn't keep up. My body started shutting down. I grew resentful of all the lying and the struggle. I started to see how years would pass us, and we would just be those stupid fucking junkies. Drugs are for the young. And I moved on. I found myself making better choices and surrounding myself with better people. A few months later, rumor has it Paul was picked up by the cops. They arrested him for breaking into houses and multiple thefts. And one piece of evidence was some random sur surveillance video of a man effortlessly riding a Segway off a dealership lot, Rolex glinting in the sun. Thank you. Yeah, that was Susan Hoyan. <laughs>